I'm going to actually thank Pastor Dan for getting me this and then abandoning it. No, it's okay. Yeah, you got that. Um, I'm uh, actually a little accustomed to being in this room because this is where we do chapel, and I'm a teacher here at the school, and I sometimes bring out my, my rolling podium. This, this lets me move so I can actually walk over and talk to the students on this side, and then I can walk all the way over and talk to the students on this side. The weird thing is this is where the littlest ones always sit, so if I, if I seem to get a little bit condescending and I'm talking to you like you're only little kids, it's because of habit. Uh, but by and large, I actually like being in this room. This room is actually a whole lot more comfortable for me. Um, and we were talking last week about anxiety. So let's get us all like caught right on up. You guys can go ahead and take the offering as you see fit. Um, sorry, let's say a quick prayer. I'm sorry, I didn't do that. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask your blessing on this offering, Lord. I ask that you continue to do great works here in this church, all the work that's going on, the reconstruction and all the building that we're doing, Lord. We just know that you are building for big things that we can bring more into your kingdom, Lord. Bless this church so we can bless others. In your name we pray, amen. There you go. That's what you were waiting on. Uh, so check, check. Oh, I'm, that's on me. I'm sorry. I'm on mute. Check, check. One, two, D2, D2. Test, test, test. I, I can keep using the handheld if you... There we go. Yes. I love being able to use both hands when I'm talking. It's the Italian in me. I'm not overly Italian like Pastor Frank. I've only got about a 50% Italian quotient in there, but I do like talking with my hands, and this lets me do that. So, uh, we've been talking about Philippians. How many of you guys have been with us for a while now? You've been coming out to the Philippians? We've been talking from chapter one all the way through, going verse by verse, precept by precept, slowing down now and again, sometimes covering just part of a verse, sometimes barely one at all. Uh, and we've learned as we've gone through ch Philippians chapters one, two, and three, that the book of Philippians is primarily about Joy, joy. Okay, it sounds like only a few of you have been here for a while. The book of Philippians is about joy, specifically joy in suffering, joy in service, joy in all circumstances, joy in things you would not think you should have joy in. And from a worldly perspective, we generally don't. Okay? But even in a worldly perspective, you can look at your job and say, oh, I got to do my job. Or you can look at your job and go, oh, I have a job. It's your choice to approach it from one perspective or another. Your viewpoint will change your attitude. I think Pastor Frank put it this way in a sermon not long back, okay, six, seven months ago. Uh, he said, your attitude affects your altitude. And joy is a chosen response. Happy is emotions. We may not be happy about circumstances, but we can still have joy even though the circumstances are what they are, because, and I've established this for a little while now, we have a good, sovereign God. If you're going to rejoice in the Lord always, as Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 gives us, rejoice in the Lord always, you can only do that if you believe he is both good and sovereign. If he is both good and and sovereign. If he's not good, then you're always worried about what you might do to get his you know, ire, okay? That's like Greek mythology. Don't mess with Zeus. Don't mess with Athena. Don't mess with any of the gods. Leave them alone. You don't want to have, oh, they'll, they'll be mad at you. If God is not good, then we have no reason to have joy. If God is good, we can be joyful, but if he's not sovereign, What's the point? If he can't be in control, it's like having a friend who has no say. I've been on field trips with my students. My students every once in a while ask if they can do something. You know, Mr. D, can we? Typically, there's things that they would ask that I could give them permission to do. You know, can we take off our sweatshirts? It's so hot. You know, sure, you could do that. That's, that's in my prerogative. I could say that. But I had students ask things like, Mr. D, we're here at this cool thing, and it's a concert thing, and it's this stuff backstage. Can we go backstage and look at it? Sure, tell him Mr. D said it was okay. I'm not in charge of this location. I can't give you permission to do things like that. It's like asking if you could run the rides at Disney. Yeah, tell him Mr. D said it would be all right. Just, just tell him to get out of the way and you can run the ride. No, of course not. So if we don't believe God is sovereign, if we don't believe God is in power, in capable control of everything going on around us, it's not easy to have joy. But if you can believe that God is both good and on your side, and is in control, then even when things are going helter-skelter crazy all around you, you can 
rejoice in all things. Not be happy about them, but rejoice because God is going to do something soon, right? So that was verse 4. We already covered that one. I'm just giving you a quick recap here. Uh, Verse 5 tells us... um, Uh, that we are to also show gentleness, or as we went deeper into it, we realized uh, consideration, to show that we are considerate to all people. Again, knowing that God is sovereign and good enables us to project that same attitude toward others. And then in the last verse that we covered last week, verses 6 and 7, we are told, Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. It really is a somewhat repetition of the previous verse that told us to rejoice all the time. Because if you're rejoicing, you're, you're not stressed. Right? If you show joy in a, in a situation, you're, you're not stressing out about it. You're not freaking out about it. We freak out a lot. We talked a little bit about some of the statistics last week. We said that there are statistics about the number of people in the United States right now that report anxiety issues. And although it's not on the rise from the last couple of years because of COVID, it's actually on a downward slope. It is on a rise in a 10-year, 20-year, 30-year window. It has been getting higher and higher in our culture. We've become a very, very rat race-oriented culture. We're always running. We're always moving. And as such, we're always nervous about what's coming up. Uh, the, The expression of you're only as good as your last success. Well, you do something really cool, and then you're waiting for one more to come up behind it, or you're a has been. There's a lot. I'm sorry, I'm freaking people out now. I'm creating anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety in our culture. And God tells us be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Um, And if we do that, if we're able to do that, the peace of God, which passes understanding, will come upon us. So if you are able to trust God, if you're able to lean on him and say, okay, you got this, you're in control, a peace will pass over you that doesn't make sense. A peace that passes understanding, a peace that no one in their right mind should have, and you'll be able to sit there in the midst of the storm going, sorry. I I remember reading a story years ago about a fairly famous painting. Uh, A church was going to uh, commission a wall painting. I don't know, they had a huge wall like ours over here, and they wanted to do a big godly painting, and the, the theme of this wall was peace, peace, and they commissioned an artist to come in and paint peace on that wall. So and that was going to be the title of the piece. Peace, the peace. And uh, they unveil the whole thing for the pastors and the, the, the whole staff and everything. And it is this monstrous mountain with lightning bolts. And you can imagine the thunder and rain pelting down upon it. And it is the most tumultuous image. You could almost hear and feel the rain. It was so intense, beautifully done, but seriously outside the planned theme. It was chaotic. And this is what they were going to have in their sanctuary to represent peace. And the pastor looked at him and said, maybe you misunderstood, but this was supposed to be about peace. And the guy walked over to the mountainside. He put his finger up on a little cleft in the rock. And sitting in the midst of that storm was a little white bird. Just chilling. Just looking around. Absolutely safe in the cleft of the rock. He says, that's peace. When the storm is chaotic, there's peace. And it doesn't make sense. And the world watches us and says, how come you're not freaking out? Or do they? Does the world see us have peace? Or does the world see us running around like them? And that is the challenge Paul is throwing our way. Rejoice always. Show compassion and and generosity And and gentleness, compassion and gentleness. And don't be anxious. But he doesn't just stop there. If that was just a don't do this, it's kind of like when we tell somebody don't be scared or don't be sad. It's not a thing you can throw a switch and turn on and off. So if, if I gave that impression last week, I don't think I did, but if I gave that impression last week, you're not bad if you struggle with this. 
If you are dealing with anxiety issues, you're not a bad Christian. You're not a failed Christian. You're a growing Christian. Because we all struggle with these things in one way or another, some more effectively than others, granted. But then there are things you're better at than I'm at, and I'm better at than you're at, and so on. But don't have the takeaway be, oh, I'm just not good at it. I've had students come to me. I'm a history teacher. I teach here at the school. I've had students come up to me and tell me, Mr. D, I just can't learn history. I can do math and science and the English stuff, but history is just, ask my other teachers. I just can't learn history. And, and, and I have to be gentle and careful and approach this properly, and sometimes I will get a little snarky. I'm like, well, obviously you can't. Like, not with that attitude. Actually, one time I actually had a student ask me, what's the least I can do for an A? I honestly answered her. I didn't miss a beat. I just flat out, and I realized I should have thought it through first. I said, well, you can't. And she was like, what? I said, well, if your approach is doing the least possible, there's no way to get an A. An A is do the best you can do. Yeah, I just want to know what the best I can do without doing a lot of work is. Like, that's just it. You just can't. I don't think she ever understood that. Okay, so if, if you come to me and you say, oh, I can't learn history, what you're telling me is you're not going to learn history. You could tell me you struggle with history. That's fair. Can't? I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And we do it sometimes with, well, I can't have that kind of peace. God says, I'm going to give it to you. But there are some things that help us get there. They're not even things that are, these are instructions, and if you don't do them, you don't get the peace. God is simply saying, here's how you get to this point. So I'm going to bring you to today's verse, okay? Today's verse, which I may or may not cover for reasons. Um, Philippians 4, 8. Philippians 4, 8. One of our all-time favorites. This is one people like to memorize. We do themes. We do church series, sermon series on it, and so on. Philippians 4, 8 is... Finally, remember he's wrapping up. This is his conclusion to the book about joy. And he says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. The King James Version puts it, think on these things. But meditate is a better phrase. Now, that's not sit there, you know, in, in your loincloth. Oh, you know, that's not what meditate means. It means keep it ever present in your mind. Be aware of these things. What things, Paul? True things, noble things, just things, pure things, lovely things, things with good reputation, things that are virtuous and praiseworthy. If you keep these things on your mind, then those results, that peace that passes understanding, the no anxiety, the rejoicing, the considerate gentleness, all of that will take the place of the anxiety and the lack of joy and the attitudes that we sometimes have. He's giving us the solution for supplanting the natural inclinations that we have. The problems that we have can be put to the side by, and I'm going to use a totally you know, a, a pop culture reference thing, uh, the power of positive thinking. But this isn't just a think it and it happens. It becomes part of you if you make this ever-present in your mind. It's not a magic trick. It's not rub the lantern and God does the thing you want. There's no genie or anything like that. It is simply human nature. And the designer wrote it, wrote it out. The guy who put the pathways in your brain that make the synapses fire and do the things they're supposed to do said, e these things, this attitude will make you a better person. You don't have to be great. You don't have to be amazing. And you're not evil if you're struggling with these things. But all of these things will make you better. Kind of like I could tell you there are foods you can eat that will make you feel like you've got more energy. There are foods that you can eat that we call empty calories. And for a brief moment, you'll feel like you've got energy and then you'll crash. Okay? You can eat a Twix bar and a Yoohoo for lunch. 
I did it for years. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I worked as a salesman and we had a vending machine and it occurred to me that if I clocked out for lunch, I'm not being paid and I have to buy lunch. But if I ran to the vending machine and got a candy bar and a yoo which has kind of got milk in it, I could keep going and I'd be paid for that hour. So for two years of working in this store, a yoo and a Twix bar were my lunch. I know, that's not good. I survived, but it wasn't good for my body, right? Well, you don't have to think about things that are true. You don't have to keep your mind on things that are praiseworthy. But God is telling us right here that if you do that, there's a benefit. There's something that comes back to you. The, ver- the last verse here, verse 9 in this thought, is the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. He's bringing the peace thought back one more time. If you focus on these ideas, true, lovely, just, praiseworthy, etc., then peace will reside in you. Now, why do we freak out about things? I, Choose, 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 uh, honest question, you don't have to really answer this one. Uh, you ever been home alone, heard a weird noise? I talked about this last week. You hear a weird noise down there. When there's somebody around, you're like, ah, what's going on down there? I'm going to get Pastor Richie on you. you know, that's easy to do, right? But when you're alone, when you're alone, there is that unsettled feeling, right? What, what's down there? Is there did somebody break in? Is that an axe murderer? 300 million Americans! How many of us are axe murderers? But that's our go-to, isn't it? What have we put in that that's our go-to? What are we thinking about serial killers when we think this is a normal thing? We've put too much in that we shouldn't have let in. Now, I'm not challenging your choices and your, your viewing habits or anything like that, but I'm saying what you put inside is what bubbles on out. Computer programmers say it this way, garbage in, garbage out. If you program badly, your program runs badly. Dietitians will tell you the same thing. You are what you eat. So here God is saying you are what you think. Well, as a matter of fact, this isn't the only place God says it. We get that idea in Proverbs as well. Proverbs 23. I'm jumping around. I know I, I, I have that one listed later. No, nope, it's right here. Good. It's the next one. Good. It's my notes. All right. Proverbs 23, 7 says... For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. It's in relation to something else, but basically that principle stays with us through Scripture. The way you think determines the way you behave, and the way you think is what you are. Uh, Put this way, uh, I had a book years ago, Who Are You When No One's Looking? I mean, I know who we can be when people are around, but who are you when no one? is looking. What you're thinking determines what you really are, right? Who you are, what you think. Um, The Bible says uh, that uh, where your heart is, your treasure will be also. That is, we put our treasure where we put our heart, not that we follow. We put the treasure in the places that our heart is connected to. Well, where your mind is is where your heart will be. What you think about will determine the way you're facing, where you're looking, if you will. Um, So all of that to say, today's little bit of a message here is uh, think right. I actually have a title for this one, think right. And I'm going to sort of deviate out of our scripture just a bit because my message kind of altered over the course of the week. This is where I was saying I wasn't sure if I was going to even cover these verses. I may cover them next week. I have some props prepared for that message, but I don't know how long this part is going to take. Think right. Let me ask a simple question. Let me get your brain juices going here for a moment. Um, true or false? Just You can answer this for yourself. Answer quickly. Answer right off the top of your head. You don't have to answer out loud, but for your own sake. True or false? A good description of a Christian is a sinner saved by grace. True or false? Just answer that question in yourself. Is that a good description of a Christian, a sinner saved by grace? I hear trues, I hear falses. (laughs) No, it's okay. (laughs) This is a question I actually ask my high school seniors. We go through this, and then I challenge their suppositions. 
It is indeed an accurate description of what we are. But I asked, is it a good description? And quite honestly, it's a dreadful description. It's a terrible description. Don't ever call a Christian or yourself a sinner saved by grace. An accurate depiction of what you are is a saint saved by grace. See, if you've been saved, you are now a saint, aren't you? And if you call yourself a sinner saved by grace, the saved by grace part is secondary. You can actually make this a kernel sentence. I am a sinner. Saved by grace is an unnecessary part. It adds extra information, but it still doesn't hold the whole sentence together. If you think of yourself as a sinner, well, you're not going to be surprised when you sin, are you? You're going to think of yourself in those terms, and unfortunately, many of us do. We forget you're saints of God. The Bible never uses the term sinner to describe a Christian. Never. We are called saints of God, beloved. We are called the head and not the tail. Even the Corinthians. I'm sorry, that that makes a lot of sense if you've read the book of Corinthians. The people of Corinth were a mess. They were horrible, horrible people. And Paul starts off by saying, you are the blessed and beloved of God. Us? No way. Okay, because as saints of God, we have a whole different relationship with God. Amen. Now, if you said yes, that sounds like a good, de- it is an accurate depiction. And of course, it's sort of a semantics issue. But as a man thinks, so is he. The way you think about yourself will determine how you act. The way you think about God will determine how you relate to God. And sometimes we need pastors to shake us up. Sometimes our pastor gets up here and he gets our whole world kind of turned upside down. I'm like, that's not the way I want it, though. It's supposed to be in the little box. It's not what these are for. It's supposed to work a certain way, but it's because we're not willing to look at the bigger issues. So think right. Think about what's noble, what's just, what's truthful, and so forth. But before I get to that, let's go here. Um, God made us uh, rational beings, okay? The question that I'm asking you now is, what are we filled with? What perception do we have? What possible misperception do we have of who God is? Don't worry, don't you have to go get past it. I think he's starting a cult. I'm not going to change anything so radically. But I'm going to ask you to take the suppositions you've made and say, oh, I've been making God tiny in a box, and God's so much bigger than this. Okay? This is what pastor has been preaching to us for as many years as you've been in this church. <laughs> but we sometimes don't hear it. And I don't know that I have, like this, I have this big, insightful way of looking at it, but talking about it makes us go, oh, yeah. And maybe you can confront some of the presuppositions that you've made. And maybe you've made them a long time ago and you've gotten past them. Good on you. All right. God made us regional, rational beings. We are supposed to think. Okay, please understand that. That is so important into who we are. We are not supposed to just go, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I don't know, anyone remember bumper stickers? God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Actually, there was a follow-up, there was a longer one. It was God said it, Jesus did it, I believe it, that settles it. And again, it may be true that you could stand on that, but I'm gonna accuse, I'm gonna make a little accusation here, I'll throw a little throw down, lazy. That is lazy Christianity. Okay? You should not just go, well, God said so, so it's true. You have a rational mind. You're supposed to say, so what's he doing here? How is this working? Why is God doing this? That is part of being a living being. Otherwise, we're sort of that you know, chatty Kathy doll. We just pull the little string and like, I love Jesus. This is, I love Jesus. This is, and we don't love Jesus. We just do it because that's what we're supposed to say. You know that little story, the little kids, the pastor's going to talk to the little kids in a kid's church. And he comes in, he's like, okay, I want to relate to them. I'm going to talk to them about a little fuzzy animal. little fuzzy animal. You guys, I'm going to tell you a little. He he collects nuts and acorns. He lives up in a tree. And the kids are all just staring. You know, big bushy tail, runs all over the yard. Little gray fellow, saves things, hibernates in the winter, saves acorns. Come on. And the little kids are just like staring at him. Finally, one of them raises his hand and goes, Pastor, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sounds an awful lot like a squirrel to me. 
See, we know the answer is Jesus. So we just say it. We don't know what it means. Are you following? Am I making this too... Uh, let me try and get my thoughts together here. Um, God made us rational beings. We often corrupt that ability to think clearly, to think rationally, to apply our knowledge and our understanding of things by overthinking. It doesn't sound like something you should be able to do. That doesn't sound like it should be a bad thing. But if you've been here, you know what I'm talking about. When you start overthinking, someone said, good morning. What did he mean by that? Why did he say that? What's he up to? What's his motive? We overthink everything. Or we've gotten so used to overthinking, we underthink. We don't think at all, and we don't pay attention to what's going on around us. We, we seem to miss the medium in between where we pay attention and we make rational decisions, and then we move on. Instead, we just think and never, never, never let it go, or we don't even pay attention and we walk right off the cliff. There is a middle somewhere in the middle, and God tells us in verse 8 what to think about to be able to think clearly. Um, when things go wrong, I don't anyone have anything go wrong ever? Just checking, okay. Um, sometimes you don't know. Um, I get more response out of you guys than I get out of the teenagers sometimes. Um, okay, um, uh, when things go wrong, what questions get asked? Okay, you, 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 whether it be Christians or not Christians, people ask a very specific question all the time, right? Why did God let this happen? I mean, when things go really wrong, okay? Lose a job, death, bad things, and people ask that question. Now, as Christians, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sounds an awful lot like a squirrel. I, 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 I'm supposed to say God said it, and that settles it, I, but I don't understand I don't understand a cancer diagnosis. I don't understand the you know, lost job. I don't understand the car breakdown. Why did God let this happen? It's very accusatory. You're not evil, but you're missing a point. You're missing something big when that's your first question. It's not wrong to think the question. It's not wrong to think the question. But dwelling on the question brings up so many problems. Okay? Why did God let this happen? Or why doesn't God just do this? Have you, have you ever prayed for your miracle and given God the blueprint? Okay, God, I need a miracle. If you do this, and then this, and then this, then that'll happen. That's all I need. God's like, I, I had a plan, but, but you're taking that out of my hands, aren't you? See, the trouble is, if you don't accept that he's sovereign, you want to tell him how to do things, right? We do it to our parents when we're little. Do this this way. Okay? Daddy cuts it in, in diagonals. Mommy cut it straight. One of those is wrong. We get really, really uptight, and we think we know what we want, and we don't always know what we want. We ask questions like, why did God let this happen? Why doesn't God just do it this way? I was having a conversation with somebody just recently, and they were saying that a, someone they were witnessing to, someone they were sharing the gospel with, was asking, well, why doesn't God just walk in the door? I mean, if God is real, why doesn't he just show up? Oof. And I was, I was kind of at a loss. I was kind of you know, giving this person some encouragement, and they hit that point, and I'm like, I, the, the, I understand, but the... He won't understand it's because it's the way he does things. And, and that's not, that sounds like a cop-out, right? The, the simple answer, and we can, we've probably done this to one another before, right? You know, you're, you're struggling with something, and you just need something to keep going. And sometimes that's all you need. But the verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 55, uh, verse 6, I'll start there. Um, Isaiah says to the people, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Remember, the people of Israel are kind of all messed up, and Isaiah is saying, come back to the Lord. It's a repent message, okay? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, okay? If the, the wicked who have forsaken God, let them return. Let them come back. Repent is the message. Um, and he will have mercy on him and to our God. God will have mercy on the man who comes back and says, I was wrong. Verse 8, 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, or are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So troubles arise. Why did God let this happen? And we throw a little band-aid over a sucking chest wound. Well, his ways are higher than ours. That's all there is. And that might be all you need to keep going. But it won't provide that peace that passes understanding unless you have already filled yourself with these thoughts. You could patch, but you're not fixing Unless this is your regular reaction to things. And if you get to where this is your habit, you do it without thinking. I'm going to take a little side note here. Uh, I did some uh, um, uh, psychology work when I was uh, younger. I was a filmmaker for a number of years. But a friend of mine was a psychologist. And uh, he shared with me there was a series of um, uh, steps that we take when we improve in an area. Anything you do. Learn to type, learn to drive, Learn God's word, okay? It applies in anything we do. When you start out anything, any new task, any new skill, play a video game, you are consciously incompetent. Tell me I'm wrong. The first time you got behind the wheel of a car, your mom and dad are like, okay, now you're just gonna, ah! You knew you did not know what you were doing. You are consciously incompetent. You, you don't know what you're doing. But as time goes on, you get a little better at it. And you start growing more accustomed to it, and you step up to the next level where you become consciously competent. When I was driving, in the beginning, I would like I'd be driving, like throw the blinker and I'd turn my, you know, turn the wheel, turn my head. And like I I would every time I'd look somewhere, I'd want to go where my head went. Slowly but surely, I would tell myself, turn head, not wheel. You know, I'd have to pay attention to what I was doing. Blinker, now. You know, do you remember, I mean, I know it's been a long time since most of us learned to drive, but do you remember having to do that when you first learned to type? A-S-D-F, A-S-D-F, A. That's what a professor had us do. Over and over, my, thing, my pinky hurt so bad. Like, over and over and over until it became easier to type, and I could consciously know that's an A, that's an S, that's a D, that's an F. Before that, it was like, ah, I have no idea. But step three, you become consciously, I'm sorry, you become unconsciously competent. I, I don't type letters anymore. I type words. My fingers just go where they're supposed to go because I learned to type. I have not paid attention to turning the blinker For years, I use my blinker. I really do. But I don't think about it. It just happens. And I hear the click, 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 click. When did that happen? Oh, I just reached down. I knew that had happened to me actually when I was mowing a lawn. I had a big, my dad had a big yard, an acre and a half out front, and it was a big riding mower. And I made a 90 degree turn. I was like, and I went and I reached for the blinker on the mower. Oh, there's there's no blinker. But I was unconsciously competent. I just did it. Now, the scary thing is there is one more stage, and this is what the warning comes out as. You can also progress to become unconsciously incompetent. And that's where you've got your blinker geats driving down the road. The blinker's been blinking for half an hour, and they don't even know because they're not paying attention to what they do. They just do things out of habit. If you fill yourself with these thoughts from Philippians 8, what is true, what is noble, what is lovely, And we're going to talk deeper about them. But if you fill yourself with these thoughts, you become unconsciously competent. And understanding that his ways are higher than my ways, piece of cake. I can rest in that. And those who don't do that regularly because they don't have those thoughts are freaking out. And they're like, I'm a bad Christian because I don't understand that. It seems like God should have done this. It's biblical to be able to say God's ways are higher. That's why God didn't change the circumstance. That's why the storm arose. That's why this thing happened. But again, like I said about the other thing, it's a lazy response. It feels like a cop-out. And if you share that with a non-believer or a new believer, it seems so capricious. It seems like God's just sort of mean. Well, because I said so. 
Which, by the way, as a parent, I have learned is a really good answer. <laughs> it's a really good answer. But it doesn't feel like it when you're told that because I said so. It feels like God's just not caring. But he's a good God. He's a sovereign God. Those two things mean he has to care and be in control. So we're missing something when we ask that question of why doesn't God just do that as though he should do it the way we imagine. Um, when things go wrong, why did God let this happen? Why, did, you know, why doesn't God just do this? Uh, it, challenges, it challenges whether God is good and sovereign. It challenges it. Uh, God made the world like this. It's just the design he did. You might as well ask you know, George Lucas, why did you direct Star Wars like that? Because it was his movie. That's what he wanted to do. Why didn't you do it this way? Because I didn't. That's a perfectly valid reason. God made a world where he doesn't just walk through the door and go, okay, guys, I'm real. But does that mean he leaves himself like distant and far away? The secular world believes so. And sometimes we do too. We act as though God has become distant to us and has not been active in our world. But what we forget is that by not filling ourselves with whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, we're not paying attention. We're missing the clues. Uh, anybody, oh gosh, um, wrong age group, but uh, are you all familiar with uh, Phineas and Ferb? Yes. Okay, good. Not the wrong age group after all. Okay. Uh, TV cartoon. It's it's fun little show on Disney+. Plus. Um, relatively moral. Uh, but anyway, the, the TV program is written by two guys, Dan Pavamere and Swampy Marsh. Uh, and they are really good writers. I, I wish to emulate them in many ways. Some of the plays I put up on the stage, I'm following their outline. Okay. They're really clever writers. And when Phineas and Ferb came to its end, they began another program using Weird Al Yankovic, of all people, called Milo Murphy's Law. And it's basically this kid named Milo Murphy who suffers from Murphy's Law. Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. There are so many in-jokes, episode after episode, from the previous show to the point where they actually brought some of those characters back in. I realize I'm giving you like a little bit of a fanboy service, but basically the fact that they're throwing these jokes in there that go right over your head if you're not paying attention mean you want to go back and watch it again and go, wait, what did I miss? There's so much there. We act like God doesn't have Easter eggs all around us. And the Easter eggs are ever, the mental Easter eggs, not the little, yolk. never mind. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I, I digress. Um, Asking why is like asking a director why he made a movie his way. Uh, we ask, where is God? Okay, as though he's going to just walk into the room and show up and say, see, I'm real. Why doesn't he do that? Because it's not the relationship he wants to have with us. You know, if, if, if Dwayne Johnson walked into the room, big, big monstrous Dwayne Johnson walked into the room and said, Mr. D, I want to be your friend. Come with me. Yes, sir. I might go because it's cool to hang out with Dwayne Johnson. I might go because I'm terrified of him. He'll never know. I wouldn't tell him I'm afraid of him. Would, would that like just not be a friendship? I, I would always be hanging around with him. You know, I, just, I don't want to, but I don't want to tell him no. God doesn't want that kind of a puppet relationship. God wants a friendship. God wants a relationship with people. Um, and when we sit and we say, you know, that, you know, where is God? Why isn't he there? Or when we hear others say it and we don't have an answer, uh, let me take you to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 14. The apostle Paul is in the city of Lystra. He is preaching really well. And the people at Lystra have come to him and they've said, we think you're a God. We think you're Apollo or Hermes or one of the, the Greek gods. You're awesome. You're a man. And they start bowing to him. And he's like, no, 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 get up. What do you think you're doing? Paul knows not to accept worship. He says, why are you doing these things? Uh, verse 15 of uh, Acts 14. We are also men of the same nature as you, and we preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them. The heaven, the earth, the sea. Anyone know Greek mythology? Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, the three big brothers who control each section, the heaven, the earth, the sea. All right, uh, Paul knows his mythology. Um, we are serving the God who made those things. Um, whereas Zeus is supposed to be the ruler of the sky, but he doesn't make the sky, it's already there. Um, 
Anyway, in who and bygone generations allowed nations to walk in their own ways. That's very important, by the way. God allowed people to walk away. He's not going to force us to follow him. People get all mad. Where's God in this situation? I'm sorry, are you anywhere, were you anywhere near him when the situation started? Because those of us that are near him are under that umbrella. If you're far away from him and then complain that he's not near you, it's because you walked away. It's that old story that, you know, well, this actually doesn't work well with cars today because there's always that mid-console. But does anyone remember when cars were a bucket seat across the whole side of the bench seats? Right? Yeah. And I, 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 I'm way too young to have experienced this, but evidently, when you go cruising with your girlfriend or your wife or what have you, you could ride along with your arm around her, and she could just like nuzzle right up against you. Right? You could just sit right there, slide all the way over, and they could be there together. So apparently, there's this old couple, and they're driving around their old Ford motor, Roadster, Roadster, what have you. And um, the wife is sitting there at the window, and she's looking out the window, and the husband's driving along, and she's like... Time was when we were young, we would drive close together. And the husband looks at her and he looks at the wheel and he looks at her and he looks at the wheel and he goes, I haven't moved. One of us has slid further away. You're all the way pressed up against the window. The driver has to stay where he's at. People who sit there going, where is God? It's not where is God. It's where'd you wander off to? We're going to wander off at the mall and then get mad that mom doesn't know what we're, where we are. You wandered off, right? So he says that God allowed people to walk their own ways. Verse 17, Acts chapter 14. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness. That is amazing. God let them go, but he left them a GPS to find their way back. He left them the trail of breadcrumbs to find their way back. He knows where they are, but they don't know where he is. That example of a kid lost at the mall... Have you been there? Do you remember? It's a long time ago for all of us, I'm sure. But do you remember turning around and realizing mom wasn't there? And then realizing that mom knew where you were? There is a terror moment of where am I? Where is she gone? And she's right there because mom would not let you wander off. God isn't unaware of where we are. So we sit there going, where is God in this situation? Like right where I was all along. And I can still see you, but you shouldn't be over there. You should be over here. He has not left himself without witness. In that, he did good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And the secular person, the unbeliever, can look at you and like, oh, so rain, that's how God shows himself? That's a way. It's not the way. Anyone ever watch lightning on a, on a, on a, a, a I'm sorry, a thunderstorm on the ocean? I, I stood on a beach, I've got actually two or three times in my life now I've had a chance to do this. Thunder and lightning out, like miles out to sea, and you just watch lightning. It doesn't fork. There's no obstacle, so it just goes straight. It's like laser blasts. It's the most awe-inspiring thing. And I watched that going, wow, good job, God. Yeah, you could sit and go, well, what's happening is the positrons are igniting along with the... Yes, that's exactly how we did it. I, I, oh, these people got their, their signs up on their lawns. We believe in science. Cool. Do you believe who wrote it? Because I believe in science. I also believe about the guy who put the whole thing together. Right? Ultimately, things all around us show us there ain't no way there's no God. My wife's been reading a biology book that she came across. It's odd that she would choose to read a biology book. Apparently, it's captivating. This guy is arguing in the case of atheistic evolution, that there's no way in the world life should exist. The guy is walking in circles. He can't explain why we're alive, but we are. And like, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, yes, it does, if there's a good, sovereign God. He hasn't left himself without witness. We choose not to listen to the witness. In Psalm 19, go back to the Old Testament, we have a similar statement, uh, 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 sorry, King David uh, writes, the, heavy, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Okay, we get all of these ideas. Day un, uh, unto night unto utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. Every day we live, we get another glimpse at the Almighty. This is the way he chose to reveal himself. I chose to wear this shirt. You can sit there questioning it. Why would he wear that shirt? 
all the shirts you could possibly wear. Why? It's because of what I picked. He chose to reveal himself this way. He chose to relate to us this way. And then we run off on our own going, why isn't he doing it the way we want him to do it? That is the problem with our thinking. Uh, Bottom line, the universe works his way. We'd rather he do it differently. Um, That's what fanfic is all about. For all the people who like write their own stories on, well, I don't think that Han Solo and Princess Leia should be together. I want the story to go this way. Okay. Or I think Perry the Platypus should show up in Star Wars. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. But that's not what the creator does to the story. He wrote a story and he said, here's how, I, how much I love you. And we're like, yeah, but do you love us this way? Why, why are we challenging his way of doing it as though we know better? Right? Um, it is not wrong to ask questions. It's not wrong to ask God why, why. And I know it's not wrong because God doesn't strike Habakkuk dead. If, if you go through the Old Testament, there's a, a minor prophet by the name of Habakkuk, and, or Habakkuk. Um, verse 2 of chapter 1, he asks the question, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? It's the second verse of his book. Lord, how long do I have to ask before you answer? That doesn't sound like a Christian question. It's a very human question. It's a very human question. Oh, later in verse 13, he asks the deeper question, the reason he's getting this way. He says, why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Lord, why aren't you speaking up when bad people do things? If God's a good God, why didn't he just kill Hitler? Because Hitler has the right to repent too? I don't like that answer. Doesn't matter? Ultimately, we know that Habakkuk is asking the deep question. Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? Why didn't you tell us what to do instead of letting us do our own thing? Well, he did tell us what to do, but he allowed us to disobey. If we didn't have that opportunity, if we didn't have free will, Chatty Kathy, pull the string, I love God. I love God. Do we love God? I love God. I guess so. It doesn't mean anything. And we'd know it. We'd have robotic responses. God says, I want to be your friend. Somebody walks up to you and says, you're my friend now, and if you're not, I'm going to beat you up. Sure. That's not a friendship. There's therapy needed there. Um, So ultimately, here's my point. The thinking. Thinking. Put the brain on the right track, and things make more sense. The question isn't, why? Why did God do this? Why didn't God do this? And this applies to positive things, too. We talk about blessing sometimes, and I've heard people talk about how they pulled up the stop and shop, and God gave them a good parking space. Glory to God. Well, yes, glory to God, because God made me capable of driving to stop and shop, and God made parking spaces, and maybe God coordinated events so that the person who was leaving found what they needed quicker than they expected to, and that parking space opened up. But if you're going to start equating the things that happen in life with a miraculous move of the Spirit, you're going to miss the miracles. God does miracles. And sometimes we trivialize things. I am thankful for the things in this world that God is in paper. Can you imagine what life would be like without paper? God gave someone the brilliance to create paper. But I didn't pull this out of the copy machine going, what a miracle, God made this piece of paper. God set events in motion years and centuries back that paper exists. And I'm thankful for that. But I don't pull into a parking space thinking that God made someone leave the store so that I would have a parking space. Because if that were the case, how do I explain the times when there isn't one? God's mad at me now. Do you see the logic? Now, it's different if I'm like, Lord, I'm, my leg hurts. I don't want to walk a long way. Please give me a parking space. I've asked for that. That's a blessing from the Lord when it opens up. Why didn't you give me the parking I'm asking the wrong question. I'm asking the wrong question. Because why basically challenges his sovereignty and it impugns his goodness. If I sit there going, why didn't you do this? Why did you do that? What I'm doing is I'm saying I know better. You shouldn't be sovereign. 
I should make the decisions. Or you're not really good. A good God would do it this way. I don't want to ever be in that predicament. Now, I understand Habakkuk, and I am often in that position. Lord, why? But there is a better question to ask. And it's like that good definition of a Christian. It's a little bit in semantics, but I want to shift your thinking just a tiny bit. Instead of asking, why did God do this? Ask a different question, a question that actually has results to it. What are you doing here, God? What are you up to? See, asking why implies, I don't know that you know. But asking what you're doing is like, can you let me in? I want to be in on the joke. Let me know what's going on. And God might say, not yet. And he might say, let me show you what I'm doing. But if you believe he's sovereign, then he's in control. So when a bad things happen, we can sit and go, God, how are you going to use this? The Christian church pretty much responded well, I think, to COVID. We could have responded a little bit better, but we did make a point of being there. I don't think the Christian church responded well to 9-11. We were late. I mean, we eventually did. But when 9-11 took place, we were as scared as anyone, as humans. But the church didn't step up and go, God has control. We were late to get to that point. But I think with COVID, we were there. We opened churches up. We had you know, uh, uh, you know, virtual ch- services. We had outdoor services. We began reaching out and telling people, it's okay, God is in control. But when, we, when a tragedy strikes and fellow Christians start going, I don't understand why God would do this. And then we put the Band-Aid on it with, well, his ways are higher. It's mean, it's capricious. We're not talking about Jehovah, that's Allah. Allah is that way. Jehovah is not. Yahweh behaves differently toward his children. I'm stepping on. Anyway, uh, it's not necessarily evil to ask, why is God doing this? Necessarily. We see Habakkuk. We know it can be a godly thing. As a matter of fact, Habakkuk says this in in chapter 2, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Habakkuk knows I don't understand this, so he's going to tell me what I am doing, what I'm misunderstanding, to correct. Correct doesn't mean slap. Correct can be, oops, you got that wrong. I'm waiting to understand what I didn't understand. Right? That's what learning is. Okay? Um, I was getting my hair cut just recently. I got my, my, my hair cut and all. And um, the girl who was cutting my hair got in over her head. Well, over my head, but still. Um, she just, it, I have cowlicks. I had a lot of hair, and, and it just wasn't, it wasn't working. And the experienced hair cutter stepped in. And it's not the first time that's happened. Apparently, I got some terrible, horrifying cowlicks. I don't understand hair at all. I didn't train for that at all. I remember one time getting my hair cut, and the same sort of situation happened. The girl was cutting and cutting and cutting, and the other lady walked by and stopped. And I saw her in the mirror, and she just kind of like raised an eyebrow, and she went, let me show you something. And she took over. And that was her way of like not saying to the customer, she just messed this up and I'm going to fix it. But that's what she was doing, right? Um, it's, it's not wrong to say why. It's not wrong to ask the why question. But if you're putting your mind on whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are noble, and all of those things that, that God says to think about, you'll be so in tune, you won't be immediately going, why? And you'll start with, what's about to happen. It'll be like watching a movie when something bad starts to happen and you know the hero is going to overcome it. You know it's all going to come together. You just can't see how yet. And sometimes it's fun to just be on the ride, especially if you know it's going to be okay. I don't know that it's true. I was told many years ago, I was in grade school, when Disneyland first opened um, Space Mountain. You guys familiar with Space Mountain, roller coaster? Um, I had friends who went and came back. I was in third grade. Uh, and they said, 
and again, I've never found confirmation that they ever did this. If you've ever ridden Space Mountain, it's a roller coaster in the dark. It's in a room only about this big. It's actually not all that impressive in the light, but in the dark, it's really bizarre to ride a roller coaster and not be able to see what's going on. And there's places where there are lighted areas, there's little you know, rope lights along the track and so on, and you can follow where it's going to go. And then it goes into total darkness, and you come around and there's more light again. But for the most part, it's Space Mountain. It's like being in outer space. What I was told by my third grade friends is that there was a place where the track, you could see the lights. They'd go down and cut to the right. But the real track went down and cut to the left. So what you thought just happened is you just left the track because it looks like it goes that way. Now, the stories in third grade were like people had heart attacks and died and stuff. I don't think any of that ever happened. But when I rode Space Mountain many years later as an adult, they didn't do that. So I don't know if they ever did do that, but that's what life feels like. I don't know which way it's going. It looks like it's going that way, and God goes, it's over here. This is where we're headed. And the thrill of the ride brings praise to our lips. So... All of that to get to this. Um, if I can accept that God is sovereign, I recognize that why is God doing this isn't the right question. What is God doing is the right question. What are you doing here, God? What is about to happen? How are you going to use this? The Bible says all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things work together. God doesn't make all these things happen. Free will, we do things. And God's like, I knew it was going to happen, so I prepared. <laughs> this is ready. What are you going to do now? I'm waiting for the miracle. Are you waiting for the miracle when troubles arise? Or are you saying, why? God's going to still do what he's going to do. It's not like he's going to punish you. Like, well, now that you ask why, I'm not going to tell you. But you're going to be a lot more, in a lot more turmoil, a lot more anxiety waiting to see it happen if you don't believe he's sovereign and good. So I found myself, like, as I say, returning to something I've already talked about, but I wanted to get deeper into that idea, almost on a philosophical level. And part of the reason for that uh, is because of the events of this week. And I realize we're almost done. So let me try to give you a very, very short, truncated version of a testimony here. Um, Last week, I talked all about anxiety, and I talked about the peace that passes understanding, and I told you, don't ever pray for patience. And I'm like, I didn't ask to, to get over anxiety. I wasn't asking God to do anything, and he's like, here's an opportunity. I'm like, please don't do this to me, God. I'd rather not. But we all have to grow. I came out of my house on Thursday morning. I was ready to mow my lawn, trim some hedges, and a guy waved me down from the street and offered to, pay, uh, to uh, seal my driveway. Um, may have happened to some of you. Uh, I started to say, no, I'm not really, but I'm very aware of the fact that my driveway is in pretty bad disrepair. I knew that it needed some work. So he caught me thinking about something that I was already thinking about. Uh, I talked to my wife about it. Don't make these decisions on my own. Uh, and we decided, okay, let's have him do it. So he came out. He blew the dirt off. He did some stuff. He sprayed the driveway down with the tar sealer. Um, in the short version of this, uh, too late, um, he may have oversold the product, okay? Uh, it's not bad. He promised it would be dry in two hours. No. No, I'm, I'm still sticky to the floor. It's not done yet. It doesn't dry that quickly, does it? Anyone ever have their driveway done? It doesn't dry in two hours. Uh, he promised that this little like, kind of filler stuff he was going to put in some of the cracks was going to expand like dough. No, it's stuck, but it, it's not bigger and it's not filling the crap, but I didn't expect it to, so it's okay. Um, he told me it would cost about, he gave me an estimate and it seemed like a reasonable estimate, and then he came back and he asked me to reassess because it's soaking it up too much because it hasn't ever been, when was the last time you did it? 20 years, I haven't done it. So well, that's why, so we need to use more. I said, I'd really rather you didn't. He goes, well, if it doesn't go in now, it won't be, uh, and I, I buckled, I gave in, the con was there. I don't know if it was a con. I, I don't think he was dishonest. I just don't think he was completely forthcoming. Well, I guess that's dishonest. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. In the end, I spent more money than I intended to, and I don't know how much longer this driveway is going to last. I'm going to have to dig it out eventually anyway. Maybe I postpone the big price for a little while. But by Thursday afternoon after he left, I'm feeling like I'm a dupe. I'm just, I'm a moron. How did I let this happen? I got to face my wife and tell her, well, it cost more than I said it was going to cost. And he didn't really, it doesn't look as good. And the cracks didn't go away. And it didn't feel like he promised. And now I got to do a little extra work. Oh, got some of the, sprayed right over some of the weeds. Like, and I asked, can you do that? And like, oh yeah, it'll kill the weeds. Like, now they're turning green again. I don't know. I feel like such a fool. 
Why did I believe him? I accepted all this. I was, mad. I was feeling anxiety. I was really, really upset. I was beating myself up. I'm a terrible husband. I should know better. I should provide for my family better. I wasted all that money. I could have done it for half the price on my own with a couple barrels from from Home Depot. I was really, really upset. By Friday, still doing yard work, going out and and doing all this stuff, looking at this driveway that I'm mad that I wasted that money. I should have done it, spent it on something else. Dinner. I don't know anything. I should have, I was was still mad at myself. I was thinking about you guys. Be anxious for nothing. You know I'm talking Actually, I think I said was shut up, but I, I, I was talking to God, so that's not the way I should have talked. I'm like, I don't want to hear it. Be anxious for nothing. I'm not anxious, I'm just mad. <laughs> All right, it's a lot of anxiety. Where's the money going to get replaced? How am I going to do? Oh, man, this is terrible. I'm just, be anxious for nothing. Oh, on top of that, he made a promise. The guy, this is the one place they were a little dishonest with me. They did tell me they were going to come back and do touch-ups. Thank you. I didn't see it. I should have. Yeah. I made a few phone calls. I'm still getting through nothing. Nothing. All right. I don't need the touch-ups. I don't care. I, I really, I've given, I'm over it. I'm over. But I wasn't. I was mad, and I was anxious, and I was frustrated, and I was just beating myself up because I'm so stupid. And I'm telling you guys, be anxious for nothing. It's so easy. <laughs> it's not easy to do. It's easy in principle. And the Lord gave me a song. There was a song kicking around on the radio. I came upon it. Some of you guys might have heard it before. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a new song on, on, the, on the radio. Um, uh, where is it? That's the thing about praise. Benjamin William Hastings and Blessing Offer. It's his name. Um, somewhere in the middle of the chorus, it says this. Um, Sometimes the only way through is a hallelujah. Sometimes the only thing is to give it to you. Um, hallelujah, hallelujah. It don't always fix your problems but it'll tell you how small they are. And that line resonated. A hallelujah. Lord, let me praise you. Lord, let me rejoice in all things. I got conned. Yay. That's not joy. That's not joy. That's, that's sarcasm. I'm not happy about this. Ah, but can I find joy? God, what are you doing here? What is God doing in me? in them, in my wife who helped agree to the city, in, in, in my daughter who watched my reaction to all this, my neighbors who saw that I got my... Somebody's getting blessed. I don't have to be any of those people. I could be the one who sits there and gets anxiety the whole time. But God is doing something. And I don't know what. I could make up scenarios, but none of, none of my stories are that good. Okay, I could come up with reasons that it's okay. But I know God provided that money that I gave them. And I go, no, God will provide more as I need it. Where's my trust? Where's my faith? I'm not happy that I gave away that money, but I got something out of it, overpriced perhaps. God is a good God. God is a sovereign God. I turned my annoyance into a hallelujah. God, I praise you, even for this driveway, which I don't think I got my money's worth, but I got something out of it. What else am I getting from it, Lord? What am I learning? Oh my gosh, is this just so I learn? I didn't want to learn this. Okay, I'll learn. I began to turn my complaints to praises for my good God. I was feeling a little bit better Saturday. Sunday morning, I walked in, I sat in the church, and Pastor Joey began preaching. Some of you were here, and some of you are like, what? All about how we praise and it changes things around us. I almost came up for the altar call. I'm like, but wait a minute. I already got this. The thing he's saying to come up and get, I'm holding it. I already got this. I can praise him even in a situation where I did a stupid thing. I can praise him even in a situation where somebody lied to me or misrepresented themselves, however you want to put that. Ultimately, my praise goes to the sovereign good God Not the, why did you let this happen? Because I asked that question at first. Lord, why didn't didn't you keep me inside for five more minutes? The guy would have driven by and never talked to me. Lord, why didn't you give him a flat tire before he got up the hill? Why didn't you have him turn left instead of right? Why didn't, why didn't, why didn't? Because I didn't. That wasn't what I was doing here. I'm in control, God tells me. And I praise him even in the storm. And this is a little storm. 
I mean, the apostles crossing that, you know, that lake and they're going to die. And I'm like, oh, I spent more money than I should have. So there's a little storm. It was big to me. You know, a scratch on your arm when you're four is huge. You know, today, it's like, yeah, pay a mortgage, kids. See what happens. Ultimately, he is a good and sovereign God. If we believe in him, how can we worry? Instead, we can rejoice in the Lord always. We can let everyone see that we are considerate and gentle. And we can be anxious for nothing, as those verses have said. And the point of praise is to think on these things. God is true, he is noble, he is just, he is pure, he is lovely, he is of good report, he is virtuous, and he is praiseworthy. All of those things we're told to be thinking about are attributes of God. So basically, the short version of this entire thing is that in this verse, God says, keep your mind on me and everything will be fine. And yet we're like, well, what do you mean keep your mind on you? Think about what is noble. Ultimately, that's going to lead you back to God. Think about what is true. Ultimately, that's going to lead you back to God. So next week, I will explain why I had these boxes here. And next week, I will talk about whatsoever things are true and noble and just and so forth. But I wanted this. You guys get the foundation now. Anyone who comes next week that wasn't here this week, they're like, oh, man, I miss so much. But I just wanted to say, when you apply it in your lives, you start seeing it happen. And God is a good God. Because Pastor Joey could have, could have preached any week. And he could have preached about any topic. And God gave him talk about praise right after he handed it to me and went, think about praise. And the confirmation was there. That's what I needed. And it may well be what you need. So I challenge you, the next time you are looking at a situation that you don't have control over, don't be surprised because you don't have control over a lot. Don't ask, why is God doing this? Don't ask, why doesn't God just do that? Ask, what are you doing, God? What are you doing? What's the next thing? What's about to happen? Ask for a little bit of a, of a spoiler. Instead of, I don't understand, and therefore I think you're doing it wrong, God. Because it really is what we're saying most of the time when we say, why? Bad things happen in this world around us. How are you going to use this, God? That brings us to our knees and then back up to our feet again. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, thank you very much for putting up with my rambling. Um, I really did have a, have a whole message about true, just, and so forth, and I guess that'll be next week, and then I'll pass the torch off to Pastor Richie the following. Um, so let us close in a word of prayer, and I'll let you guys go. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you so much that you are praiseworthy, Lord. I thank you for everything, the big things, the little things, paper, all the stuff that you've done in our lives, Lord. I just thank you so much that we can give you the glory for the things in our lives. We can praise you, and that that brings us back up onto our feet after we're facing troubles, Lord. Lord, in the midst of our troubles, I ask that you continue to remind us of this message, continue to remind us to praise you in times of trouble so that we can stand strong. In your name we pray.